Hello, welcome back to Preteen Ministry. Today we're going to be talking about the education mountain. This is very important, especially with all the discussions going on now today about which education system is the best, uh, the most effective, as well as being able to offer quality education to all individuals uh, regardless of their ethnicity or background. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the stereotypes, stipulations. We're going to get into a little bit of history today. Um, as always, uh, we're going to dive into some controversial topics, um, so kind of buckle in. Um, I'm going to pray. We're going to have a video, another video for you again today. This one I think you're really going to enjoy, um, especially if you're a homeschooler. <laughs> so, Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for education. We thank you that you gave us a mind, a mind that is to be trained. You gave us your mind, the mind of Christ. And because we have the mind of Christ, we're able to make um, good and healthy decisions. Not just, you know, having head knowledge for the sake of knowledge, um, but actually making wise decisions, using that knowledge and applying it with a biblical worldview. Um, I ask today, again, wisdom, revelation. Wisdom, revelation. Give us strategies on how to reach this generation, how to educate them, how to help them navigate um, the education that they're um, being given um, by their parents or guardians. Um, and I pray that we would just have a good time today. I love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. So uh, today's video is again from John Christ. Um, this is one of his newer ones. Um, home, it's about homeschoolers during the pandemic. Um, so we're going to watch this and we're going to talk about it afterwards. So enjoy, it's really funny. Okay, I'm just out here like on my daily walk because that's apparently like the only thing we're allowed to do anymore these days. And people ask me like, John, how are you doing? Like, John, are you surviving the quarantine? And I'm like, it's a little disrespectful because I was homeschooled. How am I surviving quarantine? Um, the same way I survived my entire childhood. John, you're not gonna be able to see any of your friends and the only people you can spend time with is your family. Oh, that sounds very familiar. Listen, it's very important to stay inside. Maybe once a day you can go for a walk or a bike ride. Oh, you mean like my entire life from age seven to 14? Listen, John, no one's gonna be able to go to work and you have to use your imagination to come up with things to do all day. My mom told me and my little brother Joe that when I was in sixth grade, we had a bike ramp and a tree house built by noon. John, we don't know how to greet people anymore do we shake hands do we fist pump do we hug what do we do it's uncomfortable yeah welcome to my entire life and every social interaction i've ever had as a homeschooler i've never known how to greet people i'm just saying don't ask any homeschooler if they're hanging in there okay during the quarantine it's a little disrespectful to the coping mechanisms we all learned as kids restart the economy has anyone asked the homeschoolers i had a thriving lemonade stand when i was six john listen just pretend that everyone has a really dangerous disease and you could contract it if you get close to them oh Oh, like how I believed the girls had cooties until I was 14? Done. Shelter in place is gonna be extended for another two weeks. Fine. Tell any homeschool kid that they'd be like, dude, two weeks? That's six Nancy Drew books and a season of Avengers and Odyssey. John, this is a very harsh reality we're living in. Dude, I'm not even here. I'm homeschooled. I'm in the imagination station with Connie Kendall. But John, all my favorite restaurants are closed. Restaurants? Dude, I was homeschooled. We don't eat out. I was one of eight kids. We went to Taco Bell once. The bill was $127. How you doing? You know where we ate? At home. My mom just made food appear from nothing. She was a wizard. Not that we support wizards, though. We weren't allowed to watch Harry Potter. Dude, literally give my mother a bag of rice, some chicken broth, and two cans of tomato soup. She will make you the entire Cheesecake Factory menu. Everyone's all stressed out like, John, I just don't know if I can trust the government. Yeah, that's literally why my parents decided to homeschool. We ain't trusted the government since day one. Listen, I get it. It's cool to make fun of homeschoolers. I've done it too, but look around. Homeschoolers are crushing it. Have you been to a Chick-fil-A drive through recently? Recently, these things are run by homeschoolers. They got three wide in the drive-thru, dealing boxes of nuggets like it's a scene from Breaking Bad. They got homeschool Heisenberg in the kitchen dropping fries while Jesse Pinkman sending everybody off with a box of chicken and a my pleasure knowing that they're going to be back in the morning for more. Uh, <laughs> John, what about social distancing? Dude, I got a Rubik's Cube for my 10th birthday. I social distanced in the basement for four months trying to figure that thing out. We're trying to find a vaccine. Okay, has anyone asked 
the homeschool moms about this? My Aunt Margaret had an essential oil combination that cured this back in April. I don't even want to hear about a mask shortage, dude. As a homeschooler, that would have been our arts and crafts project on day one. You know who was homeschooled? George Washington, Ben Franklin, Albert Einstein. You know who wasn't homeschooled? Fauci. John, this is a great opportunity to really get to know your neighbors. Oh, you mean the only people that I was allowed to socialize with growing up? Four months into quarantine, John, are you doing okay? Oh, you mean the first 14 years of my life? Yeah, I'm good. John, listen, are you surviving the coronavirus pandemic of 2020? Uh, I survived the homeschool pandemic of the 90s. I'll be just fine. So if you're a homeschooler, uh, you either feel attacked by that or you're like, yes, I completely agree. Um, in fact, homeschoolers are probably the most equipped for handling the pandemic, uh, for overcoming COVID. Um, if you agree, give me a homeschool high five. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, homeschoolers have been around for hundreds of years. Um, in fact, it used to be the premier way that kids were educated um, because everything was so much more rural. Um, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, um, there was a lot of homeschooling happening um, on farms, you know, basically the family unit kind of stuck together. Um, and it was motivated by need, not so much by, you know, personal philosophies or ideals. Um, there wasn't a lot of education for kids outside of the home taking place. Um, in fact, the modern education in terms of um, public schools or charter schools, private schools, um, a lot of that is more of a modern invention over the last couple hundred years. Um, you know, we have, and we have more than um, just one option nowadays for our kids, especially um, in Texas. Um, the United States specifically, homeschooling is not always revered as um, culturally acceptable. And so the government has provided a lot of restrictions for families. Texas doesn't have a lot of those same restrictions. Um, I should know, we actually homeschooled our son for a number of years, um, and we're gonna be talking about some of those stories. Um, and so public school today is viewed as the normal. Um, it's kind of viewed as like, well, the parents are working outside of the home. We need to do something with the kids, and public school became the thing that we do for the kids. Um, but there are, <clears throat> but there are so many more options than just your typical public school can provide. And to label that as normal is doing a disservice to the other education systems because they all have pros and cons, and we're gonna be discussing those pros and cons. Um, so let's get right into it. We're gonna first talk about public school, what it is, um, and some of my experience and my family's experience. So basically, in public school system, kids go to a government-funded institution learning government-approved curriculum. And so what does that mean? That means that your children will be exposed to whatever the, the government states as, as appropriate for that age level. And that can change according to which politicians are in office at any given time. Um, Woodrow Wilson, who was um, actually a racist president, um, he rewrote curriculum to kind of whitewash American history and that's where um, some of that whitewashed um, <coughs> curriculum that people despise so much came from was specifically from Woodrow Wilson and his policies. Um, and today, um, what's becoming a little bit more prevalent is not so much the whitewashing, but we've kind of swung the pendulum the other way and gone into critical race theory um, to where now um, any mention of whites as heroes is almost viewed as as wrong. And so instead of you know bringing it back in the balance, the pendulum swung so far the other way. You know, different curriculums in different states, you know, there's kindergartners that are learning, you know, the societal benefits of homosexuality. 
Uh, there's curriculums that are, you know, in basically making public school an indoctrination camp for any what any what any politician or political system um, wants to do for their kids. You know, Germany during World War II, they knew that they had to get the get kids educated according to um, Nazi philosophies if they're going to grow up and embracing um, those ideals. Um, so, but at the same time, if you have a good government, you're going to have a good curriculum. If you have a bad government, you're going to have a bad curriculum. And so it's just a matter of, do you trust your government? <clears throat> now, I was in public school from kindergarten all the way up to my senior year of high school. Um, I graduated from public school and um, the probably the biggest criticism of public school is standardized testing and you're not training people to think for themselves. You're training people to believe whatever the herd believes. And so in that regards, um, it can be really um, damaging. It can be really um, awful for a person's soul, um, especially since you know God calls us to test all things. Um, but if we're being challenged for challenging the system, so to speak, um, public school is really not um, geared towards you know the individual expressing his or herself. It's not geared towards um, <clears throat> you know achieving this utopia of everybody's learning styles um, being uh, acknowledged and um, tailored to um, or er people's individual needs. It's really kind of geared towards one specific type of person. Um, that's why boys really have a hard time in public school because you know, it's geared towards kind of sit down, shut up, do your work, and then you know, just kind of go on with your life. It's geared towards being submissive to the government. Um, that's really what it's how it's set up. Um, there are some benefits to public school. Um, because it's government funded, you're going to have programs at public school that you're not going to be able to get uh, any other place. Um, my son was public schooled from kindergarten up until third grade, and then public schooled again um, from his junior and senior year and senior year of high school. And what we realized in his public school um, in high school was, you know, all the opportunities, like they actually had classes um, where you could train to be a cook or a mechanic or a doctor. Um, they had, you know, all these different language classes beyond just Spanish. Um, he, if he wanted to, he could have taken French or German or Japanese. Um, and so when, what ended up happening is he had so many opportunities. Um, there's so many programs, um, equipment that, you know, every child can, can get a, a tablet or a laptop. You know, every child can get, um, you know, if they're struggling, they can have tutoring. If they have special needs, they can have a special class for them. So there are specific benefits because it's government funded. Um, basically, they're going to try to do everything they can to, to give you these benefits. Um, the challenge for my son early on was because he was that boy that didn't know how to sit still. He was an empirical learner. That means he had to touch things. He had to really kind of get into the material. Um, he, he wasn't much of a um, auditory learner or a, a visual learner. You know, he couldn't just listen to a teacher speak for 30 minutes and get the material. He actually had to like feel it. That's why he's, um, you know, really good with cars because, you know, he actually gets to get in there and get his hands dirty and feel the things and experience those things. Um, and public school just wasn't geared for that. Um, he was labeled as kind of a misfit because he would talk a lot, he would disrupt the class, and um, he would, and then he would get angry because like he was being reprimanded and it just kind of let him down the spiral. And so there are, if, if your child is really um, just kind of a content person, um, maybe public school is the place um, for you, uh, for your child. Now, I believe that the, no specific school system is kind of a one size fits all. I don't believe homeschool is better than public school or public school is better than homeschool, so to speak. I believe of doing whatever is best for your child. Um, if your child is incredibly social, 
and needs to be around other kids their age, maybe maybe homeschool's not the best option. Um, you know, I have I have a family member uh, who is homeschooling their daughter who is like extrovert plus. Like she is so extra that when she goes into Walmart, uh, like all of the cashiers have gifts ready to give to to this little girl, um, my niece, and she's, oh my goodness, she's, I think, eight years old. And she has everybody at Walmart just wrapped around her finger. They're ready to just give that gift to her and say, oh, I just love you so much. Thanks for coming through my line. And um, she's melted the hearts of some of the grumpiest people um, because she is just so, so stinking extra. Uh, and for her, you know, homeschool may not be the best option. Uh, so you have to think about what's best for your kid. Um, next on this list is private school. Uh, kids go to a privately funded institution, learning curriculum approved by an appointed board. And so what happens in private school um, is that the, the parents of kids are paying for the operations of the school. And there's um, a specific board, um, kind of like elders at a church, or so, so to speak, um, that are approving what's being taught. And so you can have a private school that is very science focused. You can have a private school that's Christian focused. Um, so you can learn Bible in a private school. Um, you have that ability. Um, and private schools can often be expensive. Um, that's kind of the downturn. And so not everybody has access to that kind of education. Um, not all private schools are created the same. Some of them are incredibly academic. Some are not academic at all. Some are just very experiential, and that's completely legitimate for experiential learners. Um, <clears throat> and we all have different learning styles. You know, some of you, some of you are watching these YouTube videos, and you're kind of sitting to yourself, just like, man, I, I just, I, I just can't sit through this um, for for like a, another forty minutes or whatever. And that's because of your learning style. I, I physically cannot meet your learning style virtually if you are an empirical learner that needs to touch stuff. Um, if you, you know, learn by you know, mentorship, like an apprenticeship, one-on-one, -on -one, teacher-student working together, I'm not gonna be able to meet that need um, because um, through virtual. I can give you visual aids and, and do my best to you know, give you PowerPoints and videos and. Um, that's why I try to meet the visual learners. Um, lecture phase, I try to give you know the audible learners you know an ability to learn. Um, that's why in person class I prefer that um, when we're talking about education because then we can have class discussion and it can get rowdy and we can process things together. Um, we can meet the visual learners. We can meet the needs of the audible learners, the empirical learners. We can you know we can meet the needs of all these different learning styles. Um, which is very limited with virtual. And the only reason I bring that up is not because I'm diving on virtual, you know, we have to do what we have to do. But, you know, um, the class, for some of you, it's not gonna be as effective because that's, I'm just, I just, in, impossible to meet your learning style. Um, in private school, um, a lot of them are designed um, to meet individual, like specific learning styles or specific philosophies. And so, um, most private schools are not going to be this kind of overarching thing of meeting the, the most common denominator like public school. Um, they're going to be more focused. Um, the benefits of them is that um, parents have more of a voice in terms of what uh, their kids are learning. Um, another benefit is a lot of times colleges um, really admire private schools um, because of the quality of education they're getting. Um, it does breed some elitism. Um, it does breed kind of this us versus them mentality. Um, but, you know, if, if you are a staunch Christian and you don't have the time or availability to give your kids a Christian education yourself, maybe a Christian private school is the way to go. And you just need to do your research and find what's affordable and, and you know, get, what, get the best thing for your money. Now... Both my wife and my son uh, were both in private school for a time. So I believe Jesse was actually 
private school from third to sixth grade. What happened was, you know, third grade he had to acclimate um, because of the cursive and he had a teacher that really didn't understand him well. And then fourth grade he had like the dream teacher that loved him and helped him through some of his issues. Same thing with fifth grade, he was succeeding. And then sixth grade came along and he had to shift to a new um, style of learning by going to like you know, this uh, segregated schedule of like A, B, um, you know, kind of like getting ready for high school. And that kind of gave him some struggles and he had to deal with bullies and um, getting, re getting reprimanded because he didn't know how to process things. And, um, and, so we, and so we had to make the decision of what to do. Is private school really the best thing for him right now? And so at that point, at the end of sixth grade, um, we kind of were forced into a position where we homeschooled him. Um, but... You know, private school served its purpose. My wife was private school uh, for a short time um, in high school. And there was things that she got out of it that she really loved and other things that she didn't love so much. Um, she ended up getting in trouble for, for some, in some of her, in some, she ended up getting in trouble for some things that she did. Um, she made some decisions that um, damaged her soul, some relationships that she had, had forged with that weren't healthy for her. And so don't think that just because you're going to private school that you're automatically um, immune to the world system. Um, it's just whatever is best for your child. I want to drive that home as much as possible. It is whatever is best for your child. Um, next is charter school. Kids go to a government funded institution, learning curriculum approved by an appointed board. So charter schools um, is kind of like the hybrid between private and public. Um, they're usually there's a waiting list because like you can have a christian charter school um, where you're not paying the arm and leg that you get from private school um and at the same time you're not also getting just these this government approved curriculum that you know whatever the state decides and so there the benefit of it it's kind of like the best of both worlds um however within the hybrid system because the government is still involved um, they're, they're still heavily regulated, um, and so there's not as much freedom. Um, but at the same time, uh, you'll, you'll, it's kind of a cost-effective uh, way of trying to get that public, that private school education. Um, not My family was never involved in charter school. Um, I know specifically in Dallas, Sif and I, uh, maybe a lot of your kids are in charter school. And maybe you've had success with it, and maybe you haven't. It's really up to you. I mean, I know in Oak Cliff that, you know, we, we knew this family, a white family that went to one of the charter schools in Oak Cliff that was primarily black, and she was bullied because she was white. Um, and we don't often hear those stories um, because we're just like, oh, well, you know, we're actually told in the education system that black people discriminating against white people isn't racism. Only white people discriminating against black people is racism. But we also know that's ludicrous because, you know, it's not even called reverse racism. It's just called racism. Anytime a race discriminates against another race for the sole purpose of that race is racism, no matter who's doing it. And we're going to be talking about that more when we discuss the government matter. So let's move forward. Online school. Kids stay home and participate in computer-based learning chosen by parents. Um, you do have online public school nowadays uh, because of the rise of bullying and the kind of responsibility to try to do something about it. Um, public online school became um, kind of available. That was kind of the intent of making public school online available. Um, but at the same time, uh, you can do online school for, for a number of different things. Uh, the only problem with that, you're not getting social interaction. Um, you know, time, you're spending more time with the screen and less time with interaction with real people. Um, so there's some benefits in the sense of you make your own schedule. Um, but the downside is, like, we are social creatures, like we discussed before, and God made us to be social. And so <clears throat> even the introverts need people. They may not want to admit it, but even introverts need people. Um, homeschool, then we get to the the controversial topic of homeschooling. Again, I was public school, never homeschooled, but we homeschooled our son from seventh grade through 10th grade, um, pretty much the years that we were at CF and I. 
Uh, he was homeschooled, and we got really creative. My wife was fantastic. Um, there was times when she worked full time and homeschooled him full time. Um, I think that was a year or two in Houston. And during that time, <clears throat> um, basically, you know, she would work from home two days, and then our son would be with his grandma for one or two days. And so we, we made a way for it to work. Um, it was a struggle, I admit it was, but that's what he needed at the time. But that's what he needed at the time. He needed to unlearn some of the, the bad things he was taught um, in public and private school, some of the bad behaviors that he picked up, some of the philosophies of, you know, just kind of fending for myself. He had to kind of relearn to do school again. Uh, we had challenges, um, but in the end, uh, we did what was best for him, and I believe it was worth it. Um, you know, the, the benefits of homeschool is you get control over your kid's education. Um, nowadays, most of homeschooling happens because of the antitrust of government. You know, we do not, not antitrust, that's a computer term. Uh, the distrust of government, sorry. And, you know, basically saying, you know, I don't want my government to educate my child, I'm gonna educate my child. Um, and it's kind of this separation from society a little bit. Um, I know a lot of homeschoolers that don't know how to use computers, don't know how to do math, don't know how to write papers, um, because there, a lot of times it's like this anti-world system mentality, and so it's not about getting your child ready for the world to be independent, it's more so about separating yourself out from the world. And so that's a lot of motivation for homeschooling comes from that nowadays. Not saying all. And there's a lot of parents that are doing a really good job. In fact, we had one family um, back at our church in Houston before we moved to Dallas. And I mean, this was like the gold standard homeschool family. Um, I, I believe it was eight kids. Um, and all of them, and I think there's only two left who are under 18 and still going through homeschooling. But a lot of them are off to college. Some of them have graduated college, landed great ministry jobs full time, um, love the Lord, strong foundation, uh, walk in a biblical worldview, walk in excellence. Um, the parents were super intentional, uh, and they kind of they kind of made the homeschool experience for their kids um, worth it. And really, homeschool is kind of make or break it according to the parents. You know, there's some parents that are very kind of, you know, you take responsibility for education, you take responsibility for your schedule, and then there's some parents that are just like very intentional, like, no, we're, I'm gonna be your actual teacher, and we're gonna work through all this stuff together, and we're gonna make this happen. Um, homeschool can be an amazing experience if the parent is intentional. If the parent's not intentional, homeschool can be very daunting. Homeschool can be very, it can actually be very damaging um, in terms of the development for, for someone. Um, kind of another con for homeschooling is, you know, the stereotype that homeschoolers do not know how to uh, socially engage with the world um, because it's kind of this whole thing of, you know, I was just, it was just me and myself or me and my siblings for most of my life and now I'm told to engage with people who are different from me and it becomes very difficult. Um, you know, especially nowadays, where, 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 all you know, this push of racial reconciliation, this push of embracing, you know, differing viewpoints, and so homeschoolers have a hard time um, engaging with that. Um, they understand it up here, but in terms of actual fit, like interacting with people who are different than them, becomes a challenge. Uh, and I'm, again, these are generalities. And, and I, I, I get that. And so there's um, some of you may have been homeschooled and you may be a social butterfly and performing amazing in the world. And that's completely legitimate, especially since there's so many more resources nowadays for homeschoolers to be able to succeed in the world. Um, homeschool conferences, um, curriculums, like the, the possibilities are endless. You know, field trips, um, using creative mediums. Like I said last time, we use Minecraft to teach our son Texas history. Um, we used so many different um, outings and um, experiences. You know, everything became a class. You know, when he was at CFNI 
and he would come to uh, chapel with us. That was a class that we could give him because he was getting a certain type of education um, when he would go to class with us, go to chapel. Um, and so we had to broaden our perspective a little bit about what education is. Um, you know, we have these different, the five, these are the five main um, education systems that preteens are experiencing, but it doesn't mean that these are the only things that are educating preteens. Facebook is educating preteens, Instagram educating preteens, TikTok, YouTube, all these things are educating preteens. And we talk about 1 Corinthians uh, 4.15, um, way back early on, the first time that I addressed um, this class, and basically what that verse says, Paul states that you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. Basically, 10,000 people willing to give your opi their opinion to you, trying to educate you, trying to force their agenda down your throat, but not many people are actually going to make the relational investment to care what happens to you afterward. And so when it comes to education, there's so many different ways that we are being educated. You know, right now my son gets educated by, you know, by playing GTA Online, uh, Grand Theft Auto. You know, he's almost 21 years old and I can't tell him what video games to play anymore. And so now he's getting an education and, um, and I just have to trust that our training um, up to the time that he was 18, um, was, we had to just trust that um, we have to trust him, we have to trust our training, we have to trust the Lord's grace um, to sustain him through all the voices that are speaking into his life now. Um, in fact, a recent testimony, uh, he, my son currently works at Wendy's and is about to, is about to enter into tech school to become a mechanic. And so he has two employees that he works with at Wendy's um, who are, I, we'll just say, slaves to the world system. Let's we'll put it that way. And um, Jesse has a Christian worldview. And so what he's done is, hey, he's like, I want to all hang out with you. But I'm not going to compromise my values and do what y'all do. But at the same time, I want to invite you all to church. And because he's such a chill guy and people love him, these, these guys who, you know, would never go to church on their own have gone to church with Jesse and loved it. Um, so, you know, that's us trusting our training, trusting the education that we gave him, as well as trusting him and the Lord's grace over his life. Um, so, um, and you can be educated um, and still be stupid. Like, you know, Jesse's getting an education right now and he still has the propensity to make bad decisions. Um, you know, we, we call for defunding the police. I want to defund a particular belief right now um, that states if everyone had access to quality education, we wouldn't have the problems we have today. That is a lie. That is an absolute lie. Because, it, I mean, I know some people who are super, super educated, PhD level educations, that are absolute morons. Let me give you an example. Um, California, uh, a bill passed in both the houses of legislature and is now on the desk of Governor, Governor Newsom. Um, and these are politicians, educated politicians, elected into office, making very stupid decisions. So let me, let me tell you exa exactly what they did. Senate Bill 145 passed state legislature both houses, um, the proposed law would reduce the penalties for sex offenders who commit certain um, sex crimes against children. Crimes that fall under this provision include non-forcible oral copulation with a minor, non-forcible sodomy with a minor, and non-forcible sexual penetration with a minor. Individuals who commit these crimes would not be required to register as a sex offender if, at the time of the offense, the person is not more than 10 years older than the child. Um, and this law, this law would would be passed for those, you know, 14 to 17. So what you can have is a 23 year old having a sexual relationship with a 14 year old, and not be penalized for it. They wouldn't even have to register as a sex offender. Um, and the reason for the law that was put in place, they said, well, um, people on this on the sex offender registry. 
you know, they have a hard time finding jobs and it follows them the rest of their lives. Well, to be honest with you, it should. I have very little grace for a 23 year old that's going to prey on a 14 year old. You know, I think about some of some of the the teenage girls in my ministry um, who are 14 years old. And if a 23 year old, that's some of the age of my youth leaders. If a 23 year old was to have a relationship, I mean, think about that. A youth pastor having a relationship with one of his with one of his or her youth. That would be wildly inappropriate. And these are educated individuals saying, yeah, that should be decriminalized. Yeah, you wouldn't have to register as a sex offender. You know, I believe that that decision should be made public and so that it does not happen again. You know, part of the reason the law exists is so that things these things don't take place. You know, I can see a lot of sex offenders moving to California because of this law so that they can have a little bit more freedom. And California is going it, to, it's going to bite them in the butt. But California is known for making these types of policies. California is known for making really stupid decisions. California is known for politicians who really don't care about unintended consequences. They don't care about, you know, they, they, they see this like particular ideal and they make a policy according to that ideal and don't think about the consequences. Last time we talked about cancel culture and how it's affecting businesses and people are losing jobs and their small businesses are going under because of cancel culture, the unintended consequence. Well, the unintended consequence with this is will be an increase of sexual activity between adults and teenagers, which is not okay. That's when education is not everything. You know, just because you have a quality education doesn't mean you're going to solve the problems of the world. You know, I think of, you know, people at Princeton. Um, is it Princeton or Stanford? One of the major Ivy League universities. Um, there was a professor who stated that we should be able to abort babies up to the age of three after birth. Now, is would you say... At that point, the education is helping society? No. You can be the most educated person in the world, have multiple PhDs, and still be the dumbest person because you're making bad decisions. Education's not going to save America. Education's not going to save your country. Education's not going to save your family. There's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus. Education exists as a way to give us knowledge. Education exists as a way for to help us apply knowledge. And that is important. A society needs educated people with skills. And I'm not diminishing the value of education. What I am is defunding the belief that education is our savior. And so when we talk about like, oh, everybody just needs to have the choice um, to go to, to their own schools. And honestly, I believe in school choice. But what I don't believe is the, the reason for that of if people can choose their own school, that means they can get a more quality education, and that means that they can um, you know, fix the problems of society. And I'm here to tell you that the most educated people in the world, if, it, if education alone could fix our problems, we would have had them fixed because we have the most educated generation in, that ever existed. We are the most knowledgeable people in the world because of the digital age, because of the interconnectedness of the world today. Never have we been more educated and never have we had such a deterioration of morality that we have today. Now let's go into um, why that is. Um, there, I'm gonna to talk to you about a trial that took place in July of 1925. This is called the Scopes Trial. Now we're going to talk about the Scopes Trial of July 1925. And the reason why this is important is because it's a history lesson for us to learn how quickly um, something can deteriorate and how it's affecting us today. Um, it was formerly known as the State of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes. Um, 
It was commonly referred to as the Scopes Monkey Trial. Um, it was an American legal case in which a substitute teacher, John Scopes, was accused of violating Tennessee's Butler Act, um, which basically said that you could not teach human evolution in a state-funded school. The trial was deliberately staged in order to attract publicity um, to the small town of Dayton, Tennessee, um, where the trial was being held. Uh, Scopes was unsure whether he had ever actually taught evolution, um, but he purposely incriminated himself so that the case could have a defendant. Um, he wanted um, the trial to move forward, even though he wasn't even sure he taught evolution. Um, but he wanted the, the case to be made public so that, um, the, that this law could be overturned. So what ended up happening was um, the prosecuting attorney, um, he was a politician and he was a Christian. And the defending attorney, um, he was an atheist who wanted to use the trial as a way to overturn the law. And then Scopes um, also believed in that, in that agenda. Well, the whole trial, um, the defending attorney was losing. Um, up until the point um, when the defending attorney called the prosecuting attorney to get on the stand. Now, the prosecuting attorney was a Christian, as we discussed, and he was on the stand. And he was asked one very simple question. Um, do you believe in the seven days of creation as outlined in the scriptures? Well, the prosecuting attorney, um, his interpretation, he said, um, well, I believe in seven days of creation, but I also believe that in science, so that it, it could be that each day represents like a million years. Um, so he kind of saw it as allegorical. So, but what the defending attorney, his smart strategy was to undermine the, the prosecuting attorney's um, testimony. And this is how he did it. What he said was, well, if the Bible is open to interpretation, um, then the Bible is open to mistakes and is no longer carry the authority that, um, that you say it has. If it's open to human interpretation, that means that it doesn't carry authority, um, that it's not just, thus saith the Lord. And the prosecuting attorney didn't even realize that. He was just stating what he believed. He didn't even think of the repercussions of, of saying this, the answer he gave. And so what ended up happening was it created this crack in the foundation of the entire Word of God. Because if Genesis is, is, not, is not taken um, you know, seriously according to its literal words that are written on the page, then how can we believe any of the rest of Scripture is literal as well? So... And how that ended up affecting us um, in the education system is it kind of had this trickle-down effect to where then the um, law was overturned about evolution to where it actually flip-flopped. Now we can't um, teach you know, Christian values in school. Now we have to teach human evolution and, um, and theory of Darwin. Um, 1962... Uh, there was another case, um, Engel versus Vitale, in which prayer was banned from schools. You know, now that the authority of God is in question, you know, why should we be praying in schools? And so that was taken out. And all of this was done under the guise of separation of church and state. Um, and that idea of separation of church and state was never meant um, to completely separate the church and the government as like two separate entities. What it was designed was for the government is not able to force the church into worshiping in a certain way. Um, the Church of England, um, that it, was, it was a state church, the Ang Anglican church, and it was against the law for you to worship uh, any other way other than the Anglican way. And so that idea of separation versus, of church and state was to give people the freedom to worship God um, in their own individual expressions. And so that's how you 
you know, in the United States, there are so many denominations because the founding fathers believed in freedom. They believed in the freedom of worship. But because of this idea of separation of church and state, um, what it's ended up being interpreted as is that we can't have the church involved in government whatsoever. You know, it became, it started off as not letting the government tell the church what to do. And now it's become not letting the church tell the government what to do. And so prayer was banned in schools, 1962. Uh, the next year, 1963, Abington School District versus Shemp, um, Bible readings were banned in schools. So we had the, you know, evolution overturned to where now it's being taught in schools and it's undermining the word of God. Um, because of the word of God was in question, prayer was banned in schools. Then it got to the point where, okay, well, the Bible is just a fiction story then, and so we shouldn't even be teaching the Bible in schools. Um, since 1963, um, it's it's been said that there's been five major negative developments in the nation's public school system. Um, academic achievement has plummeted, including SAT scores. And, you know, we don't, uh, we don't really think about that. And I want to tell you why, um, why when you take God out of education, um, why some of these things happen. So academic achievement plummeted, including SAT scores. Increased rate of out-of-wedlock births, teen pregnancies, an increased rate. Increased rate of illegal drug use. Um, increased rate of juvenile, juvenile crime. Um, a deterioration of school behavior. These are five major negative developments that happen um, when we uh, took the Bible out of schools specifically. And it started with the Scopes trial in terms of undermining the authority of Scripture. Now, I want to take the rest of this time um, to talk about Jonathan Edwards. Um, and then after we talk about this, we're going to close up uh, and I'll give you some final thoughts. So Jonathan Edwards, um, many of you know him as um, one of the revivalists of the First Great Awakening. Now, they did a study of John, they took two people from that time period. They took Jonathan Edwards, and then they took this random guy who, who was a drunk atheist. All right, And then they kind of took their, their, their genealogies um, and their heritages, and they kind of um, weeded them out over the course of like 100 years. And they kind of showed what legacy the drunk atheist um, had developed and what kind of legacy Jonathan Edwards had developed, this revivalist in the First Great Awakening. From the revivalist, what they found was he produced lawyers and senators um, and produced these like high quality, educated, um, wealthy, society, influential people. What the drunk atheist produced was more drunk atheists. Um, there was divorce, there was poverty, there was homelessness. And so what happened was, because we can only reproduce in kind, Jonathan Edwards could reproduce godliness, um, values, I mean, you know, conservative values. Um, he re reproduced that within his family line. The drunk atheist believe there was no God, you're not accountable to anybody, and so just live your life however you want. And he, re he reproduced that um, within his family line. And so what we see when we take God out of schools, we are reproducing in kind. And so if atheism is the God of public education, then if we've taken out God completely, basically, then what we're seeing is you're just living your own life, you're not accountable to anybody, and authority is challenged all the time because you can't tell me what to do. Who are you to tell me what to do? You know, if, if the Bible had, doesn't have authority and God has no authority, what makes you think that you have authority over my life? And this challenging of authority produced plummeting academic achievement, um, teen pregnancy, illegal drug use, juvenile crime, and a deterioration of school behavior. You know, it's when we, um, it's when we give ourselves over to the Lordship of Christ and understand His authority over our lives and realize we are accountable to someone. Therefore, our decisions matter, um, and we have to think about the consequences of our decisions. Then we're less likely 
um, to, to do drugs, we're less likely to commit crimes, we're less likely um, to just kind of sleep with whoever we want and not, and not you know, think about anything else. Um, we're, we're less likely to just live in the moment and we're more likely to set ourselves up for the future. And so all of that, all of that comes from education, all of that. Um, so whatever your education system is for your preteen, um, make sure God is at the center. And if, you're, and if your kid is in public school, then what you need to do as a parent is making sure that you're giving them a godly education at home still. You know, whether that's family devos at dinner time, family worship times. You know, we had situations, you know, we've done different things over the years and just kind of um, shake it up a little bit. Uh, we've, you know, you know, we'll watch sermons together. Uh, we'll, you know, eat all, each other have words together. Uh, we'll pick a topic and just discuss that and kind of do Bible studies. Uh, we'll worship together. We'll have prayer meetings as a family. And so, you know, because I know that there's going to be times that my son is not getting a Christian education. Like when he was in high school, he wasn't getting a Christian education. So I had to, as a parent, figure out creative ways to make sure he was still getting that Christian foundation um, and that perpetual training um, to make sure that he has the tools to make wise decisions. Um, I don't know about you, but I do not want my kids um, to um, plummet academically. I don't want Jesse to um, impregnate someone out of wedlock. I don't want him to become a drug addict or commit crime or you know just scream every time that someone asks him to do something. You know, I want my son to be respectful. I want him uh, hit him to be successful in his future. Um, that doesn't mean that our kids don't mess up. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no place for mercy because I do believe that mistakes happen and, and we deal with them when they arise. But at the same time, the mistakes can be minimized if we're, if we're give, giving them the right kinds of training. So in recap, um, education is not your savior. It never was and never will be. It was never intended to. Education is to give us skills, to help us apply knowledge, um, to benefit society. That's the purpose of education. Um, and when put in its proper perspective, it's a powerful tool. It really is. Um, also, um, just because, you know, there is a school that may have more money um, than the school that your kids are going to doesn't mean that they're a better school. Do what's right for your child um, for this season. Again, you know, our son went through three or I guess four seasons of different schooling because of what was right for him at that time. Um, did we make the right decision? You know, I have no idea. God will judge me at, at, that, you know, at a specific time. But do I have any regrets? Absolutely not, because when it came to his education, um, we kind of assessed, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we didn't want to train up in the, Jesse in the way we thought he should go. We wanted to train him up in the way God wanted him to go, and we felt we made the right decisions. And as a parent or as a minister, you're responsible for the decisions that you make for, for the kids that you're responsible for. Um, Preteens um, are a very delicate transition age, um, and they can e they'll either walk the ways of the Lord or they'll walk the ways of the world based on on how you educate them. And so it's a it's a heavy responsibility, but at the same time it's filled with so much joy um, in the process. Even during the hard times, there can still be joy, and there's and you're setting up your kids for a future filled with hope future filled with peace, and future filled with the presence of the Lord. Um, so uh, don't let, don't be scared by the education mountain. Uh, some of you are called to be teachers. Um, some of you are called to be administrators, and that's a wonderful calling. Um, there needs to be a, a godly voice within the culture. Um, there are public school systems in different areas and counties um, where it's still okay to pray. Um, it's still okay to um, meet and talk about the Lord. Um, there's been different efforts um, across the nation 
uh, since these different trials have taken place um, to kind of regain that education mountain. But at the same time, um, we've lost a lot of ground and um, it, it's kind of an uphill battle in getting back into public schools. But um, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not a worthy cause. So I love you. Um, see you next time when we will discuss. Let's see here. We will discuss the government mountain. Um, that's going to be a really fun time. I can't wait to see you.